Welcome everyone. Today we are heading somewhere truly um, astonishing, almost alien. The Mariana Trench. Right. We're talking nearly 11,000 meters straight down. Exactly. Total darkness, crushing pressure. I mean, it's hard to imagine. And yet, there's life down there. Life we barely understand. It really is like another world on our own planet, a place we're only just beginning to explore properly. But, and this is the key thing for today, it's not just a scientific curiosity anymore, is no, it? No, not at all. This extreme environment, it's fat becoming a new geopolitical frontier. That's the shift we're seeing. A frontier. Right. Yeah. While you know, many countries are maybe scaling back ocean exploration, one nation is really pushing hard, aggressively exploring, understanding, and maybe even thinking about claiming what's down there. Okay, so that's our mission today. We're going on this extraordinary journey down to the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Not just to see what's there, but to figure out why. Why is this incredibly hostile place suddenly so important? What's it mean for global power, for influence, and, well, for the planet? It's a huge question. It really is. And look, if you find these kinds of stories fascinating, the science, the global shifts, the stuff that doesn't always make the headlines, you should definitely check out the Geopolitics Gazette. Yeah, they do great work digging into these areas. They really do. We encourage you to subscribe. They offer some critical insights you won't find elsewhere. Okay, so let's start the journey. Picture the surface. Right above the Mariana Trench, we're in the Western Pacific east of the Philippines. And it's vast. I mean, the scale is just staggering, deeper than Mount Everest is tall. Oh, like. that's the classic comparison. And it holds up. It gives you a sense of the sheer depth we're dealing with. So take us down. What happens as we descend? It's not just swimming pool deep. Uh-huh. No, definitely not. The first couple hundred meters, the photic zone, that's familiar. Sunlight, warmth, coral reefs, schools of fish. The ocean we mostly know. Exactly. But below 200 meters, you hit the twilight zone. And things get weird fast. Weird how? Well, sunlight fades rapidly. Pressure starts to build, seriously build. By 1,000 meters down, you're in the midnight zone. Total darkness. Complete darkness. And the pressure is already uh, about 100 times what it is at the surface. Wow. That's the elephant on your fingertip kind of pressure, right? That's the analogy, yeah. It's right. immense. And life has to adapt in some truly bizarre ways. Okay, tell me about that. <laughs> how does anything survive? My ears pop just going down 10 feet. Well, evolution finds a way. Many creatures lose their color entirely, become transparent or pale. Some develop enormous eyes to catch any stray photon of light, maybe from bioluminescence. Ah, uh, things making their own light. Precisely. Others develop soft, almost gelatinous bodies because rigid structures just can't handle that pressure differential. Like the blobfish, the one that looks, know. well, sad in photos. Exactly. That's a perfect example. In its deep sea home, under all that pressure, it looks like a you know, a regular fish. Really? Yeah. It's only when it's brought up quickly to the surface where the pressure drops dramatically that its body sort of collapses into that famous blob shape. It's literally built for the deep. That's amazing. It's physics shaping biology right there. So, okay, we keep going down. <laughs> Past 4,000 meters. The abyss? The abyssopelagic zone, or yeah, the abyss. It's even colder, darker, quieter. The seafloor down here looks pretty barren at first glance, just mm. mud. But it's not just mud, is it? Not at all. That mud is actually millions of years of history. Think about everything that lives and dies in the ocean above plankton, fish, whales. It all sinks eventually. It all sinks. This constant rain of organic matter, we call it marine snow, slowly settles on the bottom. Over millennia, it builds up layers, sometimes over a kilometer thick. Wow. And this mud is incredibly rich in carbon. It's one of the planet's most significant uh, natural carbon sinks, locking away carbon for geological time scale. And sometimes something bigger arrives, like a whale fall. Ah, yes. Whale falls are incredible events. A massive whale dies, sinks, and suddenly there's this huge deposit of energy in an otherwise food-scarce environment. Like a buffet opening up. Pretty much. It can sustain a whole specialized ecosystem. Deep sea sharks, hagfish, bone-eating worms, bacteria for years, even decades. It's a rare feast, a real hot spot of life. Incredible resilience. Yeah. But we're still descending. Past 6,000 meters now. The Hadal Zone. Named after Hades, the underworld. Aptly named. Here, you're in the trenches themselves. Pressure is now over 600 times surface pressure. Only a handful of specialized submersibles have ever reached these depths. And then the very bottom, Challenger Deep, Ugh. almost 11,000 meters down. The deepest point on Earth. And even here, life finds a way. Still. 
What possibly lives there? Well, we've seen things like giant single-celled organisms, Xenophy 4s, and these tiny, pale, shrimp-like creatures called amphipods, just calmly going about their business under pressure equivalent to uh, maybe 90 elephants on your fingertip. Perfectly adapted. Mind-boggling. Historically, getting there was this monumental one-off thing, right? Mm -hmm. Picard and Walsh, James Cameron, Victor Vescovo more recently. Absolutely. Hugely expensive, technically demanding, rare expeditions pushing the limits. But that's changing. And that brings us back to China's strategy. They're not just doing these one-offs anymore. Exactly. That's the pivotal shift. They looked beyond those um, flagship missions. Yes, they sent their Fendu's submersible down in 2020 with three people, a big achievement. Right. But they didn't just, you know, plant a flag and go home. They immediately started developing smaller, more advanced subs and, crucially, robots. Autonomous ones. Designed for repeated trips, not just one big splash. Precisely. By 2024, they achieved something remarkable. A robot, no bigger than a shoebox, dropped into the trench. On its own. No cable. No pilot, no tether. It navigated, crawled on the seafloor under its own power, collected data, and came back up. Intact. Okay, that is a game changer. It totally is. It signals a move from these massive, costly expeditions to something potentially scalable. Fleets of small, relatively cheap robots exploring the deep constantly. That unlocks so much potential for discovery, and maybe other things too. It really does. And thinking about what these innovations mean, what secrets they might uncover, well, it's pretty profound. If you're captivated by these kinds of behind-the-scenes science stories and their global impact, seriously, consider subscribing to the Geopolitics Gazette. Yeah, you really won't want to miss their unique analysis on this stuff. Yeah. So, okay, fleets of robots, easier access. What are they actually looking for down there? Is it still purely science? Uh, increasingly, no. The science is still important, but the strategic value is becoming paramount. They're interested in several things. One is cold seeps. Cold seeps? What are those? They're areas on the seafloor where methane and hydrogen sulfide bubble up from below. Instead of sunlight, life here relies on chemical energy. You get these unique ecosystems, mussels, clams, tube worms, all clustered around the seep. Like deep sea oases, powered by chemistry. Why are they so interesting strategically? Well, for China, they're natural laboratories. They show how life can thrive in extreme conditions, which has implications for, say, astrobiology, thinking about life on other planets or moons like those of Jupiter and Saturn. Ah, interesting connection. And they offer insights into potential future energy systems, maybe based on methane. Plus, understanding these unique biological hotspots is key if you want to operate down there long term. Right. Then there's methane hydrate. Right, you mentioned that. Not, Fire ice. Yeah, methane gas trapped in ice crystals under pressure. It looks like ice, but it burns. A potential fuel source. Potentially huge, but extracting it is uh, really tricky, very risky. You could destabilize the seabed, trigger underwater landslides. Or release a massive amount of methane, a potent greenhouse gas. Exactly. It's a high-risk, high-reward kind of resource that they're definitely studying closely. And what about minerals? I've heard about these nodules on the seafloor. Polymetallic nodules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are everywhere in certain abyssal plains. Potato-sized rocks, basically, but packed with valuable metals. Like what kind of metals? Cobalt, nickel, copper, manganese, mm -hmm. the very things you need for batteries, electric vehicles, wind turbines, the green energy transition, essentially. So incredibly valuable. How would you even get them? The idea is to use robotic vehicles, like underwater tractors, crawling along the seabed, scooping up the top layer of sediment and nodules. Scooping them up? Yeah, then pumping that slurry up miles to a surface ship for processing. Okay, that sounds potentially messy, environmentally speaking. Hugely concerning for many marine biologists. These collector vehicles kick up enormous sediment plumes. Imagine clouds of mud drifting for miles, potentially smothering habitats that have been undisturbed for millennia. And recovery would be slow. Incredibly slow. We're talking centuries, maybe longer, for these deep sea ecosystems to recover if they even can. There's a real risk of wiping out undiscovered species, destroying unique habitats before we even understand them. So it's a major ethical dilemma alongside the technological challenge. Absolutely. The pressure to mine is growing, but the environmental safeguards, the regulations, they're lagging way behind the technology. And China isn't just thinking about popping down to grab resources. They're planning to stay, like uh, an underwater base. That's another part of their long-term strategy, yes. 
They've announced plans for a permanent base, maybe around 2,000 meters down. Not the deepest point, but still very deep. Wow, like an ocean floor space station. It's a good analogy. Designed for maybe six scientists to live and work underwater for up to 30 days at a time. What's the advantage of that? Time. Uninterrupted time in the deep environment. Time to test equipment, run experiments, monitor changes, essentially to gain unparalleled operational experience building the know-how to truly master that domain. Okay, so resources, presence. Mm -hmm. What else is down there that's strategically important? Cables, deep sea data cables. Ah, uh, the internet's backbone. Pretty much most global internet traffic, financial data, military communications, it all runs through these cables laid across the ocean floor. And they're vulnerable, right? I remember hearing about ship anchors cutting them or concerns about ships loitering near them. Very vulnerable. And yes, there have been concerns, particularly about Russian ships operating near critical cable routes. It raises questions about potential sabotage. And China's developing tools related to this. In early 2025, they unveiled a deep sea robot specifically designed, well, officially, to repair cables but it's essentially a cable cutter. A tool that could repair yeah, or disable. Precisely. The ability to quietly access and potentially interfere with these critical data arteries thousands of meters down, that changes the strategic calculation for everyone. It adds a whole new layer to deep sea control and security. Okay, let's pull all these threads together. What does this mean for the bigger picture, the geopolitical landscape? It sounds like a race. It absolutely is shaping up to be a race for control of this last frontier. Right now, the deep sea is still largely unregulated, kind of a wild west. And China's making a play. They're not just exploring or experimenting. They seem to be strategically positioning themselves to extract resources, to establish presence, potentially to claim areas, and to develop the capability to influence critical infrastructure before clear international rules are firmly in place. And how does this compare to what, say, the U.S. is doing? It's a stark contrast, actually. While China is pouring billions into ocean science, new labs, new ships, training programs, attracting global talent. The U.S. is. In some areas, cutting funding. Agencies like NOAA, which do crucial ocean research, have faced budget cuts. Experienced scientists have left. There's a growing gap in investment and, frankly, in national focus on deep ocean capabilities. So one nation surging ahead, another potentially falling behind in this critical domain. That's the trajectory right now. And this divergence, this difference in strategy and investment, it's likely to significantly shape global power dynamics, security, and influence in the coming decades. Who controls access to deep sea resources? Who understands that environment best? Who can operate there reliably? That's going to matter a lot. This really goes way beyond just interesting fish, doesn't it? It touches on energy, technology, security, the future of the global economy. Absolutely. And that's why understanding these shifts is so crucial. If you want to stay informed about these critical developments, how they connect and what they mean for the world, I'll say it again. The Geopolitics Gazette is a must read. Definitely. They provide essential perspectives on these complex, evolving situations. So just to recap where we are, China has effectively transformed deep sea exploration. It's moved from these uh, rare, almost symbolic missions to a scalable strategic program. Right, using fleets of autonomous robots planning underwater bases. Exactly. Building the infrastructure, the technology, and crucially the human expertise to operate consistently in one of the most challenging environments on Earth. The goal seems to be controlling access, securing resources, and gaining that strategic edge. While the deep sea itself remains this incredibly fragile, largely unknown place. One of the last truly wild places on our planet. 